turn our Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus in chapter 27. Exodus chapter 27, we're exploring the furniture of the tabernacle. As we look at, as we go through our study of the Old Testament, we're just starting in Genesis and, and working our way through. So we're looking at uh, Exodus chapter 27. We've talked about uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony. God, God, in his description of his tabernacle, begins from his viewpoint and works his way out. When we talk about the tabernacle, we start at the gate and we talk, you know, the altar, the labor, uh, the holy place and then the holy of holies but God starts from the holy of holies from the from the mercy seat and works his way out so he described the ark of the uh, testimony the ark of the covenant he described the atonement lid the mercy seat that goes over it and the cherubim we talked about last week that surrounded the two cherubim on the uh, curtains and the cherubim on the mercy seat and then in the holy place he described most of the furniture. There's one piece that, uh, that he leaves for the very last, and I think that's really interesting. I'm not sure why. But he talks about the table of showbread and the lamp, and then we come out, and now in verse 27, he's going to talk about the altar, or chapter 27. So we begin in verse 1 of chapter 27. You are to make the altar of acacia wood, seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide the altar is to be square and its height is to be four and a half feet you are to make its four horns on its four corners its horns will be part of it and you are to overlay it with bronze you are to make its pots for the ashes its shovels its tossing bowls its meat hooks and its fire pans you are to make all its utensils of bronze you are to make a grating for it, a network of bronze, and you are to make on the network four bronze rings on its four corners. You are to put it under the ledge of the altar below so that the network will come halfway down, halfway up the altar. You are to make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and you are to overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be put into the ring so that the poles will be on the two sides of the altar carrying it. You are to make the altar hollow out of boards just as was shown you on the mountain, so they must make it. Father, as we consider this passage, I pray that you will give us an understanding of the uh, necessity of blood sacrifice. Lord, may we see the blackness of sin. May we understand the horror of sin so that we may be drawn to repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we come into the courtyard, there's the largest piece of furniture is the bronze altar it's to be seven and a half feet long seven and a half feet wide it's a square and it's to be made out of boards and then the boards are to be coated with bronze now the bronze would have had to be very thick uh, because this altar had to be hot do you know how hot it has to be in order to uh, consume a burnt offering and we know that the burnt offering was to be totally consumed it had to be burned up about 700 degrees and so this thing would have been glowing. Uh, it's not something that you would have wanted to stand near or stand next to. This would have been a very hot, very... Uh, uh, in, uh, this would have been a reminder of God's judgment. This altar was to be four and a half feet high. Why was it so low? You look at uh, pagan altars, you look at pagan temples, and you see that their altars are very high. They're very lifted up. Well, God tells... Uh, Israel they, that he does not want his priests to climb ladders to get up to the altar. He wants the altar to be where they can reach it from the ground. And so four and a half feet high, they would be able to put the burnt offerings there from the ground. And it's to have a grating. Now, of course, it'll have a grating in the center for the fire to be on. But what we don't see is that halfway down, most pictures that we see of the altar, we see solid walls. But the scripture says that halfway down is to have a grating with rings on it for the poles to go through. Now, why would there be a latticework or a grating or a network, as uh, my translation says, on the sides? Well, for two reasons. Number one, some poor Levites had to carry this thing. <laughs> and can you imagine how heavy a solid altar would be? So that reduced the weight. But most importantly is for airflow. Like I said, you've got to have a hot fire. 
it has got to be uh, a very hot fire to consume the burnt offering. And so there had to be good airflow. So all around you'd have this grating so the air could come in underneath and reach the fire and burn up the offering. It was to have horns on the corners and the horns were to be made as part of the altar itself, as part of the structure. They weren't added on. And um, the horns of the altar are a very interesting thing, and I'm not quite sure what they mean, but we see them throughout the scripture. People would grab hold of them looking for mercy. Uh, sometimes they'd be granted it, sometimes they would be dragged from the horns of the altar to face uh, judgment. And on this altar would be the burnt offerings, the animal sacrifices. Now this altar is made of bronze. Bronze throughout the scripture is an image of judgment. This is where sin was judged. So when you first enter into the tabernacle, you go into the gate of the courtyard, this is the first thing you see. It's right there. You can feel the heat of it. And can you imagine what it looked like? We're going to read in just a minute in the book of Leviticus that they coated it with blood. It, can you imagine what it looked like? Can you imagine what it smelled like there as the priests all day long were receiving offerings from the Israelites? The Israelites would bring their sin offerings or their peace offerings, uh, their burnt offerings. They would bring them the lambs and the oxen, the bullocks, the, uh, the birds, and they would bring them. And right there beside the altar, the priest would cut the offering's neck and catch the blood, pour the blood onto the altar, and then uh, butcher the animal right there and lay it on the fire. And you could smell, if you've ever hunted deer or, or, or cleaned a deer or, or helped with uh, uh, around a farm with, uh, with butchering chickens or anything, you know what that smells like. And it's just the constant stench of death there at the altar. And the smell of the carcasses being consumed, being burned up, and the heat from the altar just radiating off. This was not a pleasant place to be. Why was this the first thing you would encounter? Why did God choose blood offerings? God could have chosen any sort of offering He wanted to. God is God, right? He decides what the, what the penalties are. Why did He choose blood offerings? Why did He choose something so, what we would consider barbaric? Something so horrible, something so disgusting, so, so nauseating, something that would grip your heart as you see these animals being slaughtered and being consumed. Because like you said, man, he hates sin. That's how much he hates sin. That's right. He wanted us to understand the, the horror of our sin. The he had to make sin. us feel it viscerally. He wanted us to, to cringe away from it the way that he does. And so the image of the cost of our sin is, is horrible so that we can remember the horror of our sin. Now we have it easy in the age of grace. Yeah. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we take that for granted so often. Father, I've sinned again. Please forgive me until I decide to do it again the next time. Why? Because we don't see our sacrifice. Our sacrifice was made 2,000 years ago. And how often do we go back to the Gospels and read the account of the crucifixion of Christ? Once or twice a year? Yeah, not enough. Not enough. For the Israelites, it was in front of them every single day. If you remember the way that the uh, <clears throat> the way that the camp was arranged, the uh, the tabernacle was dead center, and no matter where you were in the camp, you could turn and you could see the smoke of this altar burning, ascending up into the cloud of uh, into the uh, pillar of cloud that God. Uh, rested there. You could see the offerings being made. Whenever you uh, were convicted of sin, you didn't just pray a prayer. You didn't just uh, brush it off. You went and you slaughtered an animal. What would our lives be like? What would our holiness cost us if we had to see the cost of our sin every single day? And they saw the animal sacrifices there were just a a, 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 a sepia picture, just a, a, a bled out picture of what Christ did for us. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These sacrifices, as we saw in the book of Hebrews, they covered over our sin year by year. But Christ has taken them away because His precious blood, that word precious that Paul uses is unique. There is no blood like it anywhere in the universe. It is the blood of God's Son Himself that was shed for us. And we don't have a glowing altar that reminds us of our sin. But we need to look at the cross daily to see the horror of our sin. This altar was to be a holy altar. It was not to be uh, used lightly. Everything about it was to be bronze. Every utensil, every implement, even the ash box that they carried the ashes out in was to be made out of brass, of bronze. It was to be brazen to remind them that this was the altar of judgment where sin was dealt with. And it was to be handled carefully. If we turn, which you don't have to turn, but I'll, I'm going to turn to Leviticus chapter 6. He begins in verse 24. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered, the sin offering must be slaughtered before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for the sin is to eat it. It must be eaten in a holy place in the courtyard of the meat and in the tent. Anyone who touches its meat must be holy. Whoever splatters some of his blood on its garment must wash whatever he splatters it on in a holy place. Any clay vessel it is boiled in must be broken. And if it is boiled in a bronze vessel, then the vessel must be rubbed out and rinsed with water. Any male among the priests may eat it as most holy, but any sin offering from which some of his blood is brought into the meeting tent is to make an atonement. In the sanctuary must not be eating, it must be burned up with fire. And that's not the passage that I wanted to read. <laughs> oh, verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Command Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the hearth, on the altar, all night until morning. And the fire of the altar must be kept burning on it. The priest must put on his linen robe and must put on linen leggings over his bare flesh. He must take up the fatty ashes of the burnt offering that the fire consumed on the altar, and he must place them beside the altar. Then he must take off his clothes and put on other clothes, and he must bring the fatty ashes outside the camp to a ceremonially clean place. But the fire which is on the altar must be kept burning on it. It must not be extinguished. So the priest must kindle wood on it morning by morning, and he must arrange the burnt offering on it and offer the fat of the peace offering up in smoke on it, and the continual fire must be kept burning on the altar. It must not be extinguished. They couldn't put out the fire, and then when they needed it, light a new fire and, and start all over. This fire was to be kept burning perpetually. Why? Because there is no time when we don't need uh, an offering for our sin. There is no time when we don't need to be uh, offering. There's no time when we can say, well, I'm good for the next week. I don't have to worry about uh, my sin. No, our sin must be atoned continually. And I am thankful that Christ died once for all. But this altar had to be ready at any time to deal with the sin of the people. And so often we think that we can live with our sin for a while. Well, I'll get right later. I'm enjoying it right now. I'll do something about it later. But God said the fire is to be ready at all times. And even uh, the, as the priest took care of it, as the priest uh, cleaned it out and prepared it, he wasn't even allowed to wear his street clothes to do it. He had to put on a special outfit. He had to wear uh, pants, uh, which is uh, leggings. He had to wear, put on breeches, pants, and, and a, a robe over it to deal with the fire, and then he'd take those off and put on his regular clothes before he left to, uh, to take the ashes away. The ashes had to be left in a holy place, a place that was sacred and set apart only for them. This is to be taken seriously. The sacrifice is a sacrifice to God, a God that we have offended. And this altar is to be hot at all times, but not just any fire would work. In Leviticus chapter 9, God says, then he presented, we're talking about uh, the initiation of the, uh, the dedication of the tabernacle. And so Aaron is here, and then Aaron presented the people's offering. He took the sin offering, male goat, which was for the people, slaughtered it, and performed a purification rite with it like the first one. 
He then presented the bird, bird offering and did it according to the standard regulation. Next he presented the grain offering, filled his hand with some of it, and offered up, it up in smoke on the altar in addition to the morning burnt offering. Then he slaughtered the oxen and the ram, the peace offering sacrifices which were for the people, and Aaron's sons handed the blood to him, and he splashed it against the altar's sides. As for the fat parts of the oxen from the ram, the fatty tail, the fatty covering of the entrails, the kidneys, and the protruding lobe of the liver, they set those on the breasts and he offered the fatty parts up in smoke on the altar. Finally, Aaron waved the breasts and the right thigh as a wave offering before the Lord, just as Moses had commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them and descended from making the sin offering, the burnt offering and the peace offering. Moses and Aaron then entered the meeting tent and when they came out, they blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire went out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat parts on the altar and all the people saw it so they shouted loudly and fell down with their faces on the ground so they're dedicating the tent they're dedicating the tabernacle and they've got the altar set up and the people bring their sin offerings and they bring their uh, uh, meat offerings and Aaron and his sons slaughter them there and they stack it all up and they wave the parts that they're supposed to wave and they stack it all up and they put the grain on it like they're supposed to put the grain on it but they don't light it it's just sitting there and this must have seemed like a pantomime to the people you know they don't understand uh, this is a burnt offering why is there no fire and then they take the blood and they splash it on the sides of the altar so this thing is all bloody and it's got bloody meat stacked on top and it's got wood inside and they go into the tent of the meeting and they meet with God and we don't know what they said but they said Lord we're ready <laughs> you know here we are they came back out and fire proceeded out of out of the presence of God and uh, my image of this my understanding of this is because we know that the uh, pillar of fire by night the pillar of cloud by day would settle on the tabernacle when they were settled the cloud is there and fire came out of the cloud and hit the altar and consumed it right there in front of the people. Can you imagine what that was like for those people? To see that the fire of judgment did not proceed from man. We have to remember that it is not people that we have offended. We don't have to worry about what other people, when other people burn us. <laughs> Their opinion, we want to have a good opinion, we want to, as much as in us is, live at peace with all men. But it is not the opinion of men that we seek. It is not the, uh, it is not the uh, forgiveness or the, uh, the acceptance of people that we seek. It is the uh, judgment of God that we fear. It is the fire of God that, that deals with our sin. It is He that consumes the offering. It is He that not only offered Himself, but has presented His offering and has cleansed us with it and so it is the fire of God that proceeds out and we see in a few chapters I don't want to talk too much about this because I want it to be its own lesson but Nadab and Abihu Aaron's sons decide that they're going to light their own fire they they forgot to lighting a fire back then was very difficult it was an issue uh, they didn't have Bix or uh, uh, Zippos and so getting a fire lit was an issue. Sometimes they'd use, they didn't have steel, you know, flint and steel, they didn't have steel, they didn't have iron. So two flints or the old stick method, you know, they, it was work to get a fire going. And so they had fire pots and they would carry the fire with them. And this worked most of the time. Sometimes you had to blow on it a little bit. Sometimes you had to uh, pump it a little bit more and keep it going. But apparently, Nadab and Abihu forgot to keep it going. Or they forgot the fire pot back in the tent. And so they're there, and it's time to, time to start the, uh, the altar. And they forgot, and they thought, well, you know, well, there's a torch. Over. Let's, use that. let's use that lamp. You know, let's, let's just add our own fire. What difference does it make? Fire is fire. But they did not use the fire that proceeded from God. And so what did God do? He lit them up. He burned them down. We need to remember that it is not man's judgment we, we fear or man's anger we appease. It is a righteous and just God who is our judge and whom we, with whom we deal when we approach His altar. 
Does anyone have any questions or comments about? As you were going through that, <coughs> explaining it, the thought came to mind that some, like Elijah on Mount Carmel, when they, they cut themselves and they.